good time to check our cell phones uh, and make sure there's no bathroom needed. This might uh, save you from embarrassment when your cousin calls during the lecture. Hello? Um, our distinguished member, Dr. Richard Hall, founded our branch. You can't hear a thing. You can't hear a thing? There's space down here in the front. <laughs> Yeah, there's space down here in, in the front. Can you walk up a little bit? <laughs> uh, yeah, I can do that too. Like, like play the guitar and walk with the audience.
new speaker coming here from Denmark. Uh, she holds a PhD in neurobiology from the University of South Denmark. Thank you. 
all the nature. And he went out there and observed and you know, wrote about how animals have feelings, animals have thoughts, uh, animals can even be political. He would point out how ants and bees are political animals since they have these structured societies and so on and so forth. But he still had the idea that even if it was a continuum among these species, humans were unique in that they had reason. So they could think about thinking. In other words, what was special about humans was that they could be philosophers. <laughs> 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 so that was his idea of human uniqueness. Now, it, it changed, of course, with Christianity. The, uh, the idea of a continuum where animals have you know, thoughts and feelings and, and, and work sort of disappeared. And with Christianity, of course, man was, again, completely unique and special because we have a soul. And so the immortal soul is like a piece of God that's put into every one of us, did not exist in animals. So in fact, um, animals, humans, had no moral obligations to animals. And that was in, in a thinker like Descartes, that was um, put into words in, in the way that Descartes thought that, well, animals are, of course, humans have souls, they're unique. Animals are alive, but they're just biological machines, as you would call them. So they had no soul, they were biological machines, and they couldn't even feel pain. I don't know where you get the idea <laughs> yeah, that an animal can't feel pain, but uh, that lived on for you know, hundreds of years, and in Darwin's time, that was actually the prevailing thought that you know, animals may scream and howl and whatever, but they don't feel pain. It's just some kind of animal reflex. And Darwin, who was, I would say, extremely pleasing, I mean, if you read his writings, or if you just read you know, articles about uh, biology and behavior today, you will always see references to, you know, already Darwin thought of this and wrote about this in the sense of man or expression of, of um, emotions in, in animal command and so on and so forth. He really did think way, way, way ahead of his time. And the same with human uniqueness or the lack of human uniqueness and feelings uh, and emotions in animals. He was instrumental at that time in getting laws in place in, in Britain um, against you know, the, um, the mistreatment of animals. Because he said, well, we are not biological machines. And he, again, he was a really keen observer. And it, it's fascinating to read uh, what he writes about these things. One thing, um, I think the interesting quote is from The Descent of Man, where he, I mean, he tackles this question of, of you know, human uniqueness by attacking the one thing that, you know, sort of, that people at the time would say, this is what makes us human and unique, that we have a soul, so we have morals. Animals can't have morals. And then in The Descent of Man, he tells the story of an old baboon that he's seen. An old baboon who was confronted, somewhere in Africa, in you know, um, nature, he was confronted with a pack of dogs that were attacking a younger baboon. And so this old baboon actually Instead of just running away or, or you know, being afraid, he goes in on the attack and you know, drives the dogs away with, you know, um, mortal danger uh, and, you know, they could have been eaten, they could have been bitten, and so on and so forth, but he actually saves this young baboon and he takes this young baboon with him and the dogs uh, disappear. So what Darwin writes is about being descended from, you know, monkeys rather than being created by God. He says, for my own part, I would just as soon be descended from that old baboon who, descending from the mountains, carried away in triumph his companion from a host of astonished dogs and from a savage who delights to torture his enemies, offers up bloody sacrifices, practices infanticide without remorse, treats his wives like slaves, knows no decency, and is haunted by the gross of superstition. So, so of course, nowadays you can see people on the web attacking Darwin for comparing, you know, non-Anglo-Saxons of his time to monkeys. But I don't see it as that. What he actually did, did here is he said, well, look at these animals. They have some of the same drives that we think 
he would also, he would write the book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals. And here he says, um, again, he sees this uh, continuum. And he says, if I can find it. Yes, as for animals, besides love and sympathy, animals exhibit other qualities connected with the social instinct, which in us would be called moral. And so he was really, really weighed every time. And what he put there is actually what people are uh, in you know, the behavioral science and are looking at today. How do animals feel? Do they have morality, so on and so forth? And they are finding out that, yes, pretty much, it's very hard to pick up something that is unique to humans. And I'll get back to that. But for a long, long time after that, I mean, this didn't just percolate uh, down into culture. This didn't just move into science and became, you know, uh, accepted. Because for a long, long time, scientists would still, in a way, regard animals as biological machines. If we look at, for example, behaviorism in the 1920s and 30s, the idea was that animals were these machines that you could, you know, you would give them some kind of stimulus, and some kind of behavior would come out. So an animal was kind of black box with, you know, some gears and stuff that went on in there, and you would get a certain reaction from a certain stimulus. And what the behaviorists thought were that, you know, something like mind or thought processes or emotions, that wasn't really, none of those were relevant to them. Let's just, you know, look at it as a black box. You call it there something like that. Fine. So mind was only something that humans had. But then what came along, what changed things, was the cognitive revolution in uh, human behavioral sciences that came along in the 1960s. And there was this sort of, um, a lot of studies were done on human psychological processes. So we're trying to understand what goes on in there. What do we feel and think? because of this and what then you know, happened because of these processes. There was no enormous interest um, for human, uh, about human cognition, how it comes about, what it means, what we do, what we think. And that sort of rubbed off on animal behavior studies. So behaviorism was kind of you know, swept out by the human room. And people started looking at, so, um, all these things that humans can do cognitively. Uh, does that make us unique? And so one thing after another started to fall, all these different ideas of what makes us human, what makes us unique. And first of all, it was um, it was man the tool maker, of course. It used to be only humans who could make tools. And then people like James Goodall, for example, who actually went out and looked at chimpanzees in the wild, in Gombe, and they studied over decades, started to see them use tools and learn from each other how to use tools. So man the toolmaker, you know, had been last very long. And of course it came out later that other animals use tools. You can see Caledonian, the Caledonian crows, for example, will uh, use different tools to get food, and they will learn from each other. So it's not an innate behavior, it's something they actually learn. So that doesn't make humans uh, unique in any way. Um, other things like language and culture would then thought to be unique to humans. Well, no animal will speak, right? No, but not in the way that we do it. So maybe you could say language is sort of quantitatively different in humans because it's so much more developed than in other species. But there certainly are languages uh, among a lot of species of animals. For example, I think it's extremely interesting to look at orcas or killer whales. It's been found out that they have, they live in family pods, and they live in, in different um, different areas of, of the world and the ocean, very far apart. Uh, and sometimes even when you have pods and populations that are not very far apart, they, they can have very different dialects. And people who are looking into these orca languages, it really seems to be pretty sophisticated. And you can sort of tell that you know, a dialect develops you know, 
That was the first technology example. In the north, it would be slightly different from the south. And you will have cultural stuff going on in orca populations. Like you have some populations in off the coast of Norway, for example, where they will not eat other mammals. That's just not done. It's a no-no. So they only eat fish. Whereas if you go to orca populations, um, I think off the coast of Canada and um, in the uh, uh, in the um, um, not the Arctic, the Antarctic waters, you will see populations that eat seals. Uh, and even, I think it's, it's somewhere up on the coast of um, Chile, they will go up on the beach and hunt seals and take them uh, out for them. And again, that's not a innate behavior. It's something you learn in your population. And what they're seeing now, I don't know if anyone watched the um, documentary the other day on CNN called uh, Blackfish about orcas and how they are really mistreated in SeaWorld and these other aquariums. What they do there, for example, is that they take um, a, a cat from one of these you know, family groups in one aquarium and just sells it to another aquarium. Where, of course, there is a different group with a different language, a different culture, so they, you know, will receive this new camp with, hey, you can talk funny, uh, I'm going to bite you. And so they have all this violence uh, and stuff that doesn't go on in natural populations. You can simply just mix these <laughs> cultures and languages, and it's not working out really well. And the more you look into these kinds of, of animal populations and really study them, not in aquariums or in zoos, but study them in the wild, the more it's coming out that you know, gave all the things that you thought were unique to humans, but not. Another thing that came up then was, you know, the nature of, of consciousness. So, are animals conscious? That's been discussed a long time. And if they are, what kind of consciousness? But for example, a thing like theory of mind was for a long time thought to be unique to humans. So theory of mind is the knowledge that you are a self and other you know, uh, individuals have cells and you can sort of understand that, you know, what is going on in their mind because you have an understanding of yourself and what is going on in your mind. Well, it turns out that you can devise different tests to see, well, do animals understand that they are themselves, for example? And can they understand the intentions of others? And, so forth. and it turns out that a lot of animals what we call theory of mind. They understand themselves and seem to understand that things like what goes on in their head goes on in, in other uh, you know, animals' heads. And so theory of mind, measured by what we call the mirror test, uh, has been found in monkeys, all the age, elephants, whales, and dolphins, and what a lot of primary researchers call those damn birds. So, so there are actually there are a group of birds who seem to be very evolved and have theory of mind. So for example, um, the European magpie will pass the mirror test. So if you put a dot on the magpie's test, put it in front of the mirror, he will not start looking at the bird in the mirror and sort of peck at it. He will peck at his own feathers. Mm -hmm. He knows that he that who put a dot on it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it only goes with um, European magpies. I don't know why Americans talk about it. That's a discussion for a, another time. So birds, and, and this is a, a, a good example of parallel evolution of something that's you know fairly complex, something that understanding yourself, understanding others. You would say, well, that would be impossible in a small, tiny bird, wouldn't it? But, uh, but the birds have, you know, a completely different brain organization. For some reason, they have a 
are. The tribe and their sex, they won't have it. Um, but the birds are really interesting in many ways. And I just have a, a tiny video that I would like to show. But anyway, that <laughs> that says that um, the dead bird with a tiny brain can apparently figure out. Well, there are some people over there. They have you know little fingers. So they can help me pull out these quills that I can't get out with my claws. So let's go over there. So it's um, it's really quite incredible what you can see, what kind of, of intelligence you can see in supposedly different animals. Same with octopuses. I don't know if you've heard about mm -hmm. octopus intelligence, but it's, it's quite amazing. An octopus doesn't even have a real brain. It has some ganglia, so some the masses of, of nerve cells around its esophagus. That, that's what it has. But uh, octopuses can, or uh, octopi, can actually learn by observing other uh, members of their species. So if you have two aquariums, they're not linked, so they can't smell or anything that's going on there. And you have one octopus who knows how to you know, open a can or do something. And you have a naive young octopus who hasn't tried it before. And you watch the other one, and you give him a can or whatever it is. And he can perform the same thing. Absolutely amazing. Nobody knows how this comes about in an animal with practically no brain. So if you have know, scientists will go to alien intelligence, you know, it can really explain how it works. So it's, uh, it's actually pretty amazing what some animals can do. So the more you can say, the more we know about our cognitive abilities, the more we start asking, so does that exist in other animals? And, and the conclusion seems to be all the time, no matter what you ask, you find that kind of intelligence or that mental capacity, that ability in different terms. So you know, it doesn't really look good for human beings. And now, one thing we realize is that design of experiments is really, really important. Because for the longest time, we've had scientists who simply well ask the questions of animals in, in, in the wrong way so that they can't really to answer. Um, a good example, I think, oh, basically one thing I want to mention is that um, animals gained consciousness in 2012. <laughs> there was a big declaration that came out that it, it is now, the, you know, um, there's so much support for the fact that with brain structures that underlie what we would call uh, consciousness. Yeah, they do exist in all kinds of animals. 
well-developed feelings and emotions that we have. The question is, why wouldn't they? I mean, emotions were developed way before evolution, way before all these advanced cognitive uh, things and you know apps that we have. So the emotions are, you know, come out of those most primitive brain areas, and they were the original sort of guides to how we behave. You know, you have an emotion of I'm frightened or I want the food, whatever. That came before, you know, philosophy. So, Barbara J. King, for example, who's an anthropologist at the College of Women and Mary, has written a book called uh, How Animals Breathe. So she's been looking into, well, is there such a thing as animal grief? And a lot of times people will still be up in arms saying, but why would animals feel grief? They might, you know, hang around some old bones and stuff, and is that really grief? Oh, I just want to show this guy back to the English, because I think really, if there's pinnacle of evolution, it's meaningless. You know, they are just way cuter than anything. And they are very smart. So the ratio of cute to smart is pretty good. <laughs> anyway, back to animal grief. It seems that with, if you start, again, like Darwin, if you observe, you sit down and observe animals, what do you see? Um, and for example, elephants are really, they're a very good example of animals that seem to have some kind of what we would call grief. I mean, when, when other elephants in their group uh, die, they will not only hang out around the body for a while, but they will keep coming back to the bones and sort of, you know, nudge them a little bit and, and hang out there. And, I mean, what would you call that if, if, it, if it isn't related to grief? It's still anecdotal evidence, but I think that when we figure out a way to ask those questions. For example, if you could do brain scans for some of these animals, you would probably see the same thing that you see in humans, that social pain or grief will have, you know, activity in the same kind of areas that we activate when we feel physical. But those experiments haven't been done yet. You see other examples of, again, orcas, who will, you know, start screaming if you take away their cats, for example, uh, and will, you know, go ballistic, basically. And the same thing you can see with, with monkeys, you lose their, their young or, or whatever it is. And then the question is, why on earth would animals not have the capacity to breathe? Another thing is, um, is friendship. And it's, that's another thing that a lot of times we've been saying for a while, well, animals don't have friends. I mean, we have friends and it's unusual and probably even unique because they're unrelated people to us. And so we don't have any, you know, genetic gain or evolutionary gain in having friends. That's, that's so unique. Uh, and then you start, again, looking at animal populations in the wild. And you can see, for example, and there's studies have been done on this, if you look at the interactions between young male chimpanzees in natural populations, they will hang out with other young male chimpanzees, and it's not correlated at all with genetic relatedness. So it doesn't seem that they, you know, only support the ones that they're genetically related to or share food with them. They simply choose individuals that they like. And just to show another little, I think I, I just simply have to show this because this is uh, the oldest friendship you could ever have. It is a um, sloth named Prince and his friend the cat. <laughs> a sloth, a three colored sloth, who is absolutely crazy about it. <laughs> <laughs> and they hang out in the home of their, their owner, and the cat enjoys it as much as the sloth, apparently.
have the emotions that you thought that you were the only one privileged to have. What does that say? Is that not sort of, I think it's a challenge to, to our own morality to look at how we treat Because in many ways, in many instances, we still treat women as, you know, biological machines that can't be Look at, for example, uh, the way we grow chickens, the way we grow pigs, and, you know, I'm from Denmark, we grow pigs under a falling condition. And I mean, I think I would kind of want to end with a, um, a quote from Nietzsche, who said, We do not regard the animals as moral beings. Could you suppose the animals regard us as moral beings? <laughs> I think that's a really good question. And with that, uh, I would thank you for listening and hope you have comments and questions. Love you. Thank you.
Squirrels do that. The squirrels yeah. save nuts, yeah. Yeah. but it went to a lot of good in school. Yeah, we're forcing right. and couldn't sum it up. And you really couldn't remember what it is. Well, my question is yeah. oh, no. Okay. Shh. Okay. 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 Thank you. 
actually says, <laughs> I just read this study of, uh, it seems that chickens, who are not regarded as the most intelligent birds, but chickens are very intelligent. Like they will be in, in a group, and some of them, you know, one of them will spot some kind of predator coming from above. And if, if, it's, a, if it's male, and he's around a lot of females, he will warn the whole group, oh, there's a predator coming, let's go this way. If there's no male in the group, he just wonder all the time. And you can say, chickens have, uh, or roosters have um, certain behaviors and certain signs when they want to mate. And you have, in a, in a what do you call it, a flock of birds, flock of chickens, you have the alpha rooster, which is it's, it's all kids it's female, right? Uh, but there are other little roosters out there. And so people, so the alpha male will, will do the whole display with, you know, sound, click up, click up, click up, and then he's just blowing things in the head. And so the female will say, oh, okay. Uh, but the, uh, the other roosters will not do the sound. They'll just stand there and he's just sort of blowing with the head. And, <laughs> and, and he has a few females. So they, they're not discovered and, and, you know, pecked on by the alpha male. And, I mean, deception, every, every animal who's a social animal has, you know, deceptive uh, ability. Because that, you need that for social groups. I would think that, for example, um, when you see it in dogs, cats are not 